and scoot to your left a little. Happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome back. As always, I am your lawyer friend, Zach, and we're joined today for the world this week by the one and only Dr. Stan. And uh, by request, we're going to do a discussion of airport signs and markings. You got some really, really hip uh, readers and <laughs> listeners out there. That's the top thing. That's right. Well, and and I think, uh, as, you know, as, as we jump into it, I think that it's an important thing to have if for no other reason than when you're looking out the window you at least have some idea of where you are i mean if, if you're one that likes watching airplanes take off and land and you recognize that you're paralleling in a, a runway you can look out the window and you know see airplanes mm -hmm. taking on or off or if uh, if the pilot says you know we're number 50 in line and you look at your window and you're lined up with a taxiway well you probably gotta wait uh, 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 i'm more wait worried was when i'm landing and then i keep seeing the the four lines and then the two lines and then the one line and then suddenly the overrun lines and we're not <laughs> stopping yet. That's what I worry about. But that's just me. Exactly. So one of the uh, resources, and this is actually a uh, available to everybody. The FAA puts out this publication. It's called the AIM, the Airman's Information Manual. Or I think it's Aeronautical Information Manual now. It's originally the Airman's Information Manual. It's those, well, let's see. What's it say? From, uh, it doesn't say. It just keeps saying just says aim okay so uh it, it's it originally was airman's information manual but mm -hmm. because you know women are uh, in often cases probably better pilots than some of the men that i know yeah it's often referred to as the aeronautical information manual it is not regulatory in nature you know the regulations say that you uh for example what type of training you have to have and how often the airplane has to be inspected and how much time you have to be uh, sober before you can fly things like that those are regulatory in nature if you violate one of those then you find yourself you know, it face, facing administrative penalty up to and including um, uh, re uh, revocation certificates. Yeah. The aim, on the other hand, is um, suggestive in nature. And so if you find yourself sideways with the FAA, this is a great tool that you can rely on. Well, why did you do that thing? Well, I use the aim. The aim yeah. says it's recommended. To do yeah. Aim says it's recommended best practice. Uh, like I said, it is not necessarily regulatory in nature, but it is certainly a helpful tool to have. And uh, it's broken into sections or broken into chapters based sort of on, you know, discipline, uh, you know, then it has everything. And so you can see here on the screen we've put up in this case, chapter two, section three, airport markings, signs uh, and aids. And so we use a variety uh, of information presented different ways. Uh, ultimately, we use four colors. We use red, white, black and yellow. And sometimes it's painted onto the concrete or the the asphalt, and other times it is um, uh, suspended, like on a vertical sign. Well, and, so yeah, here we're talking about airport, or actually runway markings, and then there's also signs, which sometimes are on the ground, but mostly stuck up and lit. Hopefully, it, we were actually in a meeting earlier this week about adding some additional signage to to our airport property, and. Uh, uh, one of the folks on our safety committee said, you know, we, you know, we had talked about, you know, do we want to sink in some anchor arms and hang from it? And if mm -hmm. it's displayed properly, they're actually on breakaway posts so that if a mower hits it or an airplane departs mm -hmm. a taxiway and strikes it or something, the sign just simply snaps off and falls over and you just replace those breakaway attachments um, and, and, and re-adhere it. I think uh, the airport, we're, we're very fortunate at our airport. We don't have a lot of accidents or incidents, uh, whether it's among our students or even from the flying public. Mm -hmm. The most common uh, culprit of damaged airport signs and markings is the lawn mowing crew and you know they're they're knocking over a taxi light or a runway light or something along those lines yeah it's and so uh section two of the uh chapter two sorry uh, chapter two section three of the aim uh, outlines what that looks like and we'll go through that but i think stan's working on pulling up uh, some images here we've got uh we go. and so as a general rule um anytime you see red it's approaching a runway and, and we the, the colors are organized based on the worst possible outcome if i if i uh, intercept or or cut somebody off on a taxiway the worst thing that happens is somebody in front up front gets grumpy some a pilot gets grumpy and a runway if i cut somebody off the worst thing that happens is exactly what happened uh with the pan am 
uh, kill and flight in Tenerife. Oh, Tenerife, yeah. Well, where two airplanes on the same runway at the same time. Uh, you know, uh, Pan Am was trying to exit. KLM decided that we're going to take off come hell or high water, and then a collision. And I think it was the deadliest. Still, the deadli deadliest single incident. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the events of 9/11 excluded, of course. Yeah, that's just. And and. Uh, and so anytime you're approaching a runway, the so he's yeah, he's pulled up some of the markings here. So that's that's an uh taxi intersection. For the red Ooh. stuff. Keep talking, we'll oh, okay. find something. Okay. <laughs> and so uh there were there were there were some up there. Uh like there was an intersection of Tango and runway one three sign yeah, earlier. Like that. Yeah. 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 So here's an example. Uh you will see this both hung on a sign and painted on the runway. And if it's got the square around it, in this case, or the, the border around it, in this case, there's a yellow border. The border indicates where you are. So if you see this sign here where it says T18-36, this the box around T means I'm at intersection Tango. My airplane is sitting on the concrete that's identified as taxiway Tango. And I am uh, at the intersection of Tango and runway 1836. And so if I if I were looking at this sign, it would be accompanied with a double yellow, double dashed runway hold short indicator. So you can see there the, the red signs and the arrows. Once you understand what you're looking at, it's really quite simple. Yeah. So if it's yeah, black and white, but it's it's black and white here. But if you were if you were to look at uh uh take your cursor up there. Yeah, where'd my cursor go? There it is. Yeah. 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 So if you look there, uh if 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 the taxiway is tango. And I'm, and you know, that's the runway. The box is around the letter T to identify Tango. And then the double solid, double stripe indicates that is a runway hold short. I am allowed to go from the dashed side to the solid side without permission. I don't need a clearance. We call that the C word, mm -hmm. the, the word cleared. I don't need a clearance to go from the runway to the taxiway. But I must have a clearance to go from the taxiway to the runway. I cannot go solid to dash without a clearance. That doesn't mean cleared for takeoff. Mm. I could be the lawnmower with a, with a headset on hooked to a radio talk to the tower. And they say, okay, enter runway one five. You're cleared to enter runway one five at taxiway Tango. I still got cleared to enter the runway. I just didn't get cleared for takeoff. They're not going to clear me to mow, but they are going to clear right. me to enter and the runway environment. And something that they changed a bunch of years ago is now the last thing you will hear when you're ready to go is they'll give you the, you know, the wind and then uh, the blurry, any other message. And then the very last thing, it'd be clear for runway three, five cleared for takeoff. That's the very last thing is in the past. It used to be earlier on in the message and you could forget it or get confused. Oh, so to, uh, tell me, Uncle Zach, how come there's two sets of lines there on the top and one set on the bottom? What do those mean? So uh, the bottom one down there where the cursor is, is called the ILS critical hold. And what that means, so the instrument, the ILS is instrument landing system. It's a, it's an aid that we use to find the runway at night or in bad weather or other adverse circumstances that result in reduced visibility. And we use radio frequencies to essentially line two needles up, just like, uh, like the sights on a weapon. And as long as I keep those crosshair centered, uh, at some point in theory, the runway's right there in front of me and I'm positioned to land. If that technology is activated, if the ILS is on and being used, the antenna specifically for the glide slope, which does my vertical guidance, mm -hmm. is not on the runway. It's offset off the runway just a little bit. About a third of the way down the runway and operates around two to 300 megahertz, so in the UHF range. And if that is on, they will often activate the critical hold because if, if I've moved my airplane between the critical hold there, that bottom bottom set of lines and that in the hold short line, my airplane's in the way of that signal. And the ground, the glide slope signal is actually bounced off the ground and reflected airborne. Otherwise, the tower would have to be hundreds or thousands yeah. of feet tall. So yeah. due to technological limitations, they bounce the signal off the ground and I can pull my airplane and be in the way. And so that uh and so what they'll say is hold short of the critical hold, taxi two and hold short of runway one five. A hold short of the critical hold. Uh, and that tells me don't go all the way to the runway hold short line. Stop before you get there. Now, if it's severe, uh, severe clear in a thousand like it is today, I think what well, you know, we had some wicked rain yesterday, but it moved all that all that that front out of the mm -hmm. that, all that, that system out of the area. So now we're in the up mid 50s, upper 50s, uh, but great visibility. You can see all the way to from Dallas if you climbed a big enough tree from where we where we are. 
Uh, I, we don't need the ILS that day. So in that case, they'll rug me all the way to that air, that, that runway and hold me short. And so uh, the ILS is composed of two components. There is a glide slope antenna, and that gives me my vertical guidance. And yeah. then, and there's once a, a picture on the web is too big. Yeah, let me quickly swap you over and see. So here's a, there's an airplane landing, a nice Gulf Stream. Yes. So this is the glide slope antenna, and it actually has three antennas on it, neck to the runway. <clears throat> and there, this is the approach end. This is bouncing the signal off the ground and then up at about three degrees. And there's actually two signals. Oh, I'm using my hand, so I have to. <laughs> so there's two signals going up one parallel to the other and they overlap and where they overlap exactly you're on glide slope and they do the same thing on the localizer on a different frequency with two frequencies that overlap and if you give receive both of them exactly the same you're on on your localizer or on your azimuth so yeah it's critical that you not park your airplane in those areas because you can screw up the signals and if i'm if i'm on an if i'm in an airplane on that ils approach and somebody blitzes we, you know, the, 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 the slang term is that I blitz the holds or I blitz the critical hold. They pass that critical hold and park it and stop that airplane or even just temporarily move that airplane and interrupts a signal. If I lose that signal, even momentarily, I have to go missed approach. I have to stop my approach to the runway, fly around and try to either get vectors back or get some other uh, resolution. Uh, to the flight. Now, everything means something. So really narrow runways, the runways don't have edge markers. They don't have edge paint. You know, normal. So these colors are inverted. Where the black one five is would actually be white. The pavement would be dark yeah. colored. Um, Other pictures here somewhere. Uh, I'll find stuff. Keep going. Okay. Um, and so yeah. So yeah. So there's the hold short. And when you see the yellow and black are taxi. So if you see in this case the fifteen is yellow on black, that means you're here. If the yellow or if the fifteen was black and the sign was yellow, it means that's where you're headed. So when you're there, the colors invert, and it, it helps us know where we are. So that it's is regular the regular in the instrument hold line. Yeah, there's the the uh, runway hold short critical hold, and then this these are taxiway direction indicators. You can see well, and you can see the color shift there. We need to switch. Oh, we're not even on it. Yeah, we're not even. We're not paying attention to what we're doing. Yeah, so there you can see this the color switch. You're on alpha on this taxiway. And then, and then yeah, yellow on black. Yeah, Tango is up and to your right. Echo is immediately right. Foxtrot is uh, forward and left. Echo is straight left. Um, so on and so forth. And so uh, when you when you get to where you are, the colors invert. Black, uh, yellow on black shows where you are. Black on yellow shows where you're going. Um, and so here, those are uh, this. Mm -hmm. Oh, just where the, oh, taxi. Where taxi yeah. Now that that black three right there is distance remaining in feet. Where the, oh, that that oh, we gotta cut to it. Yeah. That black three right there that indicates. So if you're if you're on the runway and you look at your window and you see those signs going by, it'll say eight seven six five four three. That's number of feet remaining before you run out of runway in thousands of feet. Um, during daylight, that's not normally a problem. If I'm doing a like a category two or three ILS with really low visibility. It lets the pilots know, well, at 3,000 feet, I need to be below a certain speed if I'm going to make the exit. Or maybe I'm taxiing at 40 knots to clear the runway, but I see the 3,000-foot sign. I need to start slowing it down and getting this big airplane slowed down so I can make that turn at the end. Here's another sort of a whole runway environment. So here you can see the actual runway starting here mm -hmm. and then the numbers. It's hard to see the other stuff. See an airplane holding short. Here, though, you see all these antennas. These are the localizer antennas, which are pointing down the runway. So these would be for the landing opposite direction coming toward the camera. Um, the antennas for the landing in this direction would be all the way at the other end of the runway. And somewhere down here off to the side would be the glide slope antenna. And what's all these funny chevrons here, Uncle Zach? So uh, the yellow chevrons are unusable runway. They are, they are for runway overrun purposes. Um, in case it, in because they're, they're not usable for takeoff or landing, but if I, if I do, if I have an engine, engine fire and I, I'm, I'm a triple seven, so I'm loaded full of gas for a 10 hour flight and I'm two hours into the flight, well, I'm going to be way heavy. I'm going to be several hundred pounds, thousand pounds, probably over my maximum allowable landing weight. So that's there. So I can use it in an emergency, but it, it's not of the same strength or material or quality as the main runway body. So those yellow chevrons mean I can't use it. 
Now, on that picture, if you looked at the very back end of that picture, right at the right in front of the antennas, there was that bright gray, almost white colored concrete. And um, this is a relatively new invention. You see uh, that that gray right closest to the camera there. And uh, no, we don't. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> um, this area here. That's called an EMAS, Engineered Materials Arresting System. And so, uh, what you'll notice if, 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 like, you see these, like, I think at uh, San Francisco, mm -hmm. at Kennedy and LaGuardia. They, they found some at um, LaGuardia with uh, that's right. Pence's uh, jet went during the last campaign. That's right. And so, anytime you don't have enough dirt, enough grass to have a safety a safety area, mm -hmm. they can put the EMAS in there, and it's concrete that they pump full of air bubbles, and they take the rebar out of. So when an airplane rolls through it, it is designed to collapse. The EMAS, EMATS. EMAS, e e uh, Echo Mike Alpha Sierra. Yeah. Um, and so it's designed to collapse under the weight of the airplane, and the collapsing concrete absorbs all of that energy to help the airplane slow down. Airplanes are going to go to maintenance, and they're going to close the <laughs> the airport yeah. or the runway but it, to it service it. But it shouldn't hurt the airplane too much. But no, it's designed to keep the airplane as intact as it can be. And uh, go. oh, he found a good, oh, this is a good picture. Yeah. Yeah. Make it bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So there you can see it's it's come from here and it's just distorted the concrete and it's uh, embedded. It's going to slow you down pretty quick, but not overload the gear and hopefully not rip your gear off. Exactly. It's designed to keep the people safe and the important structural components of the airplane. Oh, some cool how they make them. Yeah. There you go. Um, you know, they, they can, so in this case where they were painted black, that was an asphalt runway. Mm -hmm. They'll paint them white when it's a concrete runway yeah. to match. Yeah, um, so you it, can see it distorted there, stopped the Challenger. Yeah, same thing there, right? It ran through, had the overrun. And what it does is it shortens the amount of distance. Now, it's interesting uh, that uh, we hope we never need them, but when we do, we're glad they work. Uh, and if you're on one of those airplanes, um, odds are when you generally, when EMAS is involved, it's not generally pilot error. There was some sort of emergency. I had a brake failure. Couldn't get my spoilers out. Yeah. Reversers didn't open some, some, some sort of yeah. mechanical. I had a, you know, often if I have like an in-flight engine fire where I have to shut an engine down, um, I don't have reversers. I'm not going to pull just one reverser cause I'm going to have a yawing moment. Right. Yeah. And so I've lost some piece of equipment due to failure or, or breakage. Uh, where I need where where I need the EMAS, so you'll see those super common at big airports that handle heavy airplanes, uh, and they don't have like you're not going to see them at DFW because there's still a half a mile or more of dirt in each direction off the end of the runways. It was interesting. There's a uh, in the love hate relationship um, at uh, Santa Monica Airport. Um, there's not much room off the end of the runway, and there's just a little bit of grass, chain link fence a little bit of grass and then roads and houses and now this is, used to be the douglas plant out there back when it was surrounded by orange groves and everything is built up around it so they wanted to put that system in there for overruns but the city really wanted to shut the airport down but they couldn't because of the money they had gotten from the faa they had to keep it open for a while and their thought was if we put that in there that makes the airport safer and more people want to come and we don't want more people to come so Let's just keep it dangerous. So oh, amusing. Um, funny. Oh, we have any questions? Oh, I was just I was scrolling the, the scrolling the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead and go and throw. I like that image. Go and throw that image. Yeah, it's a good picture. So here we can sort of see the whole picture. Um, where it says threshold. With those, we call those the short term shorthand is piano keys. Well, you'll often hear Pastor Fred as oh, I touched down on the piano keys, or, or the bars. Well, it's called, it's called the bars. The, the aim identifies the wider the runway is, the more number of stripes there are. There's no correlation that I found. You just sort of have to memorize <laughs> yeah. the number of stripes relative to the runway width. But the widest runway you can have is 150 feet that, that I've seen. Now, there's some decommissioned and repurposed yeah, military cool. facilities, yeah. um, but generally speaking, 150 feet. The edge markings um, show uh, you go past that white line, you're going to end up off-roading yeah. in probably an airport designed for on-road performance, yeah. as yes. it were. Yeah, you don't have a four-wheel drive airplane. The landing designator tells me what runway I'm on. In this case, I, I'm on runway one three. The R indicates right, which implies there's also there's a run three. Runway over here, yep. someplace. Run, runway one three left over there. You'll see the, uh, the the center line. Unlike a car, where we want to keep the entire car on one side or the other, we want to keep the the nose wheel of that airplane and the center of that airplane going right down the middle. Yeah. That way, if I've got imagine having big wings that are several hundred, you know, a couple hundred feet across from wingtip to wingtip. If I get off the center line, I could start knocking signs over. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of risks. So we keep it on the center line. In fact, 
for the commercial pilot check ride, one of the criteria that you're evaluated on is your ability to land on the center line. You know, oh, well, you landed smooth, but you missed the center line by by half an airplane width. You know, the the uh, commercial pilot airman certification standards say the applicant shall land uh, shall maintain land on and maintain during rollout the center line uh, as one of the one of the testable tasks. And then you'll see the aiming point. Those are a thousand feet down the runway. So from the threshold to the big white uh, blocks, actually called the captain's bars, the captain's they bars, like the rank of captain. Mm -hmm in the air force in the army and the marine corps not the navy that's right um those are the, we call those the, the thousand footers the captain's bars that is the aiming point the goal would be to cross over the threshold at 100 feet above the ground and land at the thousand foot and that's roughly a three degree descent give or take yeah. um because pilots train for this imaginary obstacle the 50 foot obstacle at the end of the runway and the expectation is you clear the 50 foot obstacle by an additional 50 feet. Okay. So that's a hundred feet over the end of the runway. And then you descend at three degrees to the aiming point and you touch down. And then you'll see short of the aiming point, those three bars, and then past the aiming point, two smaller bars, and then one, 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 one. Each one of those is an additional 500 feet. So the, the, the three bars are 500 feet past the end, then the touchdown or the aiming points a thousand feet, then 1500, then 2000 and the pilots can do that math. Uh, and the big thing is if, you know, if my operation specifications indicate the airplane must be landed and spoilers deployed within so many feet of the, of the end of the air of the, of the runway into the runway. If I am not in that configuration by, I, by the time I pass that mark, I do a go around, or if I've already landed, I do what's called a, a, a an aborted, an aborted landing. Yeah. And this was, um, problems if you remember the american what 1420 in little rock mm. they landed long did spoilers didn't deploy automatically it was a wet runway or in a storm and yeah they ended up off the end of the runway so don't do that no we we actually we had a safety stand down yesterday and there was a discussion about uh drift and and uh deviation of norman of uh, of uh norm, yeah. of norms yeah and uh you know a airline that was since uh, since acquired is uh airtran call sign citrus had some pilots land and they departed uh, or that they landed departed the runway thought they were headed the right direction mm -hmm. nobody was paying attention to what was going on and they proceeded to taxi into a ditch oh. and that airplane by the way is still flying with delta airlines at the moment here's um uncle zach what's the difference between all those uh, other lines the big v lines and these lines so this is what's identified as a dis a displaced threshold so that means that where the long white arrow is right at the end of the runway, just off screen there, you can start to see the 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 uh, taxiway entrance. Well, and even even further back down here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. You can enter the one runway right there, or you can go down, flip the airplane around, back taxi, turn it around. You can use all of that for takeoff. But you can't. You can only land once you get past that white line that denotes the threshold, and you get to the piano keys. Yeah, and you can see the different surfaces. Some of these on the approach end where you actually touch down with some of these big airplanes that could be many feet thick of you know concrete or other material to take the the forces and this is not set up for that the other reason you will uh the other most common reason you see a displaced threshold would be there's some sort of obstacle that would be deemed unsafe to try and clear and land on that end mm -hmm. so they'll just place the threshold you can use it all for takeoff in airplanes with the exception of the cirrus mm -hmm. <laughs> most airplanes need a lot more runway to take off than they do to land because you're accelerating there during the entire takeoff process, you are decelerating during the landing process. So you can land. It's very possible to get an, air, an airplane into an airport you can't get it out of. Yes. It's not it's not unheard it's certainly of. Certainly not full. And so it, occasionally you'll see like Southwest landed at the wrong Branson Airport, mm. <laughs> and they had to because of the length of the runway they could land it but they couldn't take off so they had to offload some fuel mm -hmm. and they had to bus everybody all the passengers and their baggage and it was just the flight crew a different flight crew i might add and uh, a air force crew did this and landed at pete knight field in florida instead of uh mcdill air force base and um and they managed to stop it but um it was was it a c4 or c17, c17 or c5 c17 i knew it's big yeah and what about what does this mean zach the big bright L, the big bright yellow X means thou shalt not. And uh, did, did, are, would, might any former senior senators from Oklahoma have landed on such a runway? 
Uh, yeah, in fact, the the now former senior senator Jim Inhofe, who to his credit was a great advocate for aviation, and great he did yeah, yeah. general aviation. Yeah. The, the other political issues I have with him aside, <laughs> he was a great advocate for for general aviation. He was a great advocate for the military installations in Oklahoma. So he did some good things. He did some not good things too, but he did some good things. One of the one of the not good things that he did, and he was an avid pilot. Um, he owns a couple of airplanes and he, used his aircraft to meet his constituents. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did use his airplane in the in the for in further good use of an airplane. Exactly. He was flying a 340 Cessna 340. I forget where he was flying it into, but ATC said that he had the whole runway. Well, before that, he, allegedly, he had not check he had not checked notums to see that the airport was closed. Correct. And then he flew down there, and then uh, allegedly ATC said you have the whole runway. He came into land. And there is a construction crew actively working on the there's, runway. There's an X and people and equipment. B big yellow runway. X. It's notum closed. If he had done it anyway, he crow hops them, lands, rolls out. And then I was told I would have the entire airport. Well, that's not a clearance that one gets. And if it's an untowered airport, if I'm talking to ATC and I'm landing at like my local airport here, where we do our training with no control tower. They just say contact advisory frequency. Mm -hmm. See you later. I don't have to have permission to land. But if the runway is closed, it is unlawful to land. So he had a uh, he had a visit and a discussion with the FAA, and I think they gave him what we refer to as a seven hundred nine ride. He just had to go do a competency ride to demonstrate that you know. And and what he, else did we get out of this though? Uh, we also got the pilot's bill of pilot's rights. Bill of rights. <laughs> which um, those rights have always existed, but most pilots they were never explained to yeah. what. And it's for example, if you're being investigated by the FAA, you have a right to review all of the evidence against you. If there are ATC recordings or other uh, data-based evidence, you have the right to have that uh, produced to you and, and an opportunity even, to even review before it. Before that, because it's not a criminal act, it's uh, administrative law. Um, FAA guys talk, come up and just talk to you. Um, you have the right to remain silent, as you always do, but they don't have to tell you like a cop does if he's going to arrest you. And so, yeah, they don't have to tell you that. Um, and there's a bunch of other things where. You have rights, but it's because the, the the worst sanction the FAA can do is take away your certificate, which for some people is your livelihood, but for somebody else, it's just maybe an inconvenience. But yeah, the rules are different um, and they can uh, not infrequently at some places would just go start talking to people and they would admit to doing all sorts of weird things. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I'm Bob from the FAA and they're duty bound to report that because they just heard about an infraction. And, and that's where when you in the regulations where it says an airman shall upon request by law enforcement officer, Department of Homeland Security, uh, the FAA, the yeah. NTSB or any other person authorized under this part uh, produce their pilot certificate. That doesn't mean give it to your pilot. Yes, you may look at it. You are not required to, to relinquish to, it from your to control. surrender it. Yeah. Uh, unless you're a student pilot, once you get your private pilot certificate or beyond, you don't have to have your logbook in the airplane, mm -hmm. nor should you. So if you're out there flying around with a private pilot certificate, leave your leave your logbook at home. You don't need it. I promise. Uh, because if you have it with you, they have the right to inspect it. But if you're not required to have it with you, then hey, do you have your logbook with you? No. Okay. Yeah. Not the end of the world. Um, they may at some point decide that they want to do an audit to make sure that you have the uh, the appropriate qualifications to operate. And they'll say, we'd like to have a meeting to uh, to go over with you what uh, uh, what's happening. You say, okay, we are we will find a time that's mutually um, convenient. convenient to both yeah. of us. And then I will bring my logbook in person and I will probably have an attorney at my elbow yeah. while I go through that process. And this is the other thing, um, um, you know, they always have um, what you can do legally, what rights you have and, and when you choose to exercise them. And. Um, one of my rules is generally don't argue with people with guns. And if you're familiar with anything with aviation, the names John and Martha King are pretty big. They have all these videos. I think they're two of the only people that have like every certificate and type rating mm -hmm. in existence from balloons and airships and seaplanes, everything. But yeah, they have lots of educational. Multi-engine seaplane, <laughs> powered parachute instructor, like yeah, you name it, they've got it. Yeah, so I think they have you know interdimensional starship ratings. But, um, they were flying an airplane which had previously had a different end number and was listed in a database as an aircraft had been stolen and had been used for drug smuggling. And they were flying it in, I forget where it was, uh, Santa and remember, Barbara. John and Martha are in their 70s, yeah. so they're not 20-somethings either. Yeah. And here's a picture of after they got stopped and they told them to pull off side runway and Officer Friendly and a partner came out and made them get out and do the old, uh, you know, hands up and, you know, Walk back to the sound of my voice, yeah. get on your face, put yeah. your hands behind your back. Yep, there's Martha coming out. So stuff like that happens. But um, yeah, just in general, 
in non uh law enforcement stops mm -hmm. yeah fao ask you for just like your car driver's license your airworthiness certificate um and uh current registration you know, current registration yeah. for the aircraft and you're required to show them that but after that yeah just like your car they, you don't have to let them inside the airplane you don't have to open the trunk or you know look in cargo areas um, of course they can bring out some canine friends too you know and there's some supreme court case law just in the last several years that pertains to roadside uh, dog searches to try and establish probable cause. And the Supreme Court has said, because it used to be you would just detain and detain and detain and the, the canines, you know, an hour away or something. The Supreme Court said 30 minutes. They just, they drew, the Supreme Court doesn't give us bright line tests, but they gave us a bright line test. It said 30 minutes. You are not allowed to delay a stop right. at all. Um, if you are able to go at the time you finish your investigation for the wrongdoing, as far as writing a ticket for speeding or whatever, right. if the canine's not there, you got to let them go. Right. Uh, but in no case can a stop exceed 30 minutes unless probable cause exists at that no, point, then yeah. it takes as long as it takes. And so it, the, there's no case on this, but if I'm ever in that situation, the FA is sort of dragging their feet. Is there anything else I can help you with today? <laughs> oh, I think we're about finished here. Cool. Get out of my way. I'm leaving. Well, no, give us just a second. If the dog's not here, I'm leaving. If the dog's here, they get to walk around. But yeah. if the dog's not here, man, I like dogs. Yeah. We saw, I saw Yuri when I got here today. Actually, Yuri Gagarin is yeah. the uh, who's the the house cat here at the garage mall. Yeah, he's the Which, uh, by the way, with, the, uh, the protector. Yes, the uh, there is the garage mall. Beautiful day here in Durant, Oklahoma. Some of the trees are starting to sprout. Very high pollen counts for all you yeah. sufferers out there. You walk around, everybody's eyes are all swollen. I promise they're not doing cannabis. No. They're just allergic to they the wish world. They were. Because yeah. uh, they'd look the same, but they'd feel a lot better yeah. <laughs> if they'd been doing cannabis. Oh, wrong button. We're. Uh, we're still working on the workflow. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, when, when, when you have a, when you have a dummy corporation, you need a couple of dummies to run it. Yes, sir. You know, normally uh, the the high budget operations, there's a uh, there's a technical director punching all the buttons in the well, back for us. But we well, are the limited technical. liability companies, and we're I think a limited intelligence company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. LLCs and uh, LICs. L yeah. yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, we'll see if we got any any good questions today. Any hate mail? Oh, I'm sure there's always hate mail. Graphics are good. Audio so-so. Stan needs to move the mic a bit closer. Okay, we can do that. Is that better? There we go. I'm used to the wife who just like doesn't want to listen to me anyway. So. <laughs> Thanks well, for your confidence. Neither Stan nor I hear very well. So when we sit in, 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 the other, in one another's office having a conversation, it's a shouting match. Are you guys mad at each other? No, it's just a normal Tuesday. And I will mention to people, if you're speaking with me and I start laughing hysterically, it's because I probably misheard you and what I thought you said was hysterical and what you probably did say is probably deadly serious and you took offense. But yeah, that's happened before. Ford, Ford says, uh, what must it be like for colorblind, colorblind pilots or is oh. that a condition that stops you from piloting? Well, that's a really good question. Yeah, you can. It, color and blindness isn't typically an off on thing and it usually mostly... Uh, um, red green you know yeah it usually affects mo most of the people who are colorblind it affects are people with external genitalia and the uh there's different colors you can be blind in there's actually one lady who has an extra um extra cone she can see into the yellow she can see colors that other people can't uh, there's actually they documented some of these with genetic tests but yeah typically we have three different uh cones tells it detect color and you could be colorblind but that doesn't mean you see everything like a black and white movie and if you can demonstrate a thing called the statement of demonstrability um, they can show you a chart and you can say yeah that's blue that's magenta that's yellow and you can see it well enough to distinguish the colors you can see the light gun signals at the tower you can get that statement um as uh, part of your physical and you could do it. just like um you know, if you're hard of hearing, they might require you to have a noise canceling headset. Or if, uh, you know, you have a, we had one student who had uh, one artificial leg below the knee and she demonstrated she could operate the aircraft without any modifications um, with her, her artificial leg. And then she had statement of demonstrated ability. So if some, she goes in for another physical, you had a peg leg. Yep. I'm good to go. Yep. And you're good to and go. The, the statement of the demonstrated ability actually removes that requirement from future um, future uh, evaluation when you yeah. go in for your medical and it would be in your record. And they say, Oh, well, I see here you have a, you have a, a, a color vision soda. 
and called right. a soda. We have a color vision soda, so therefore, I'm not going to make you do the color vision test. You're just going to have to do the uh, the the Snellen chart, right? The the visual uh, accuracy. How well can you see? Uh, can you see? Yeah, and that's um, speaking of which. Speaking of, oops, wrong damn button again. We'll get this. There we go. Um, so those are the pseudo isochromatic plates for testing color vision, the Ishihara test. Um, this is an excellent screening test. If you take the test and you don't fail it, you're not colorblind. If you take it and you don't get all of them correct, you may or may not be colorblind, but it just takes a longer, more in-depth test. So if you've ever failed this test and you think you're colorblind, talk to your uh, eye doctor or optometrist and say, I'd like to get the more... Uh, the, the, in -depth test. Yeah, there's more accurate tests. There's one, one I took was called the lantern test. Mm -hmm. and they'll put you in a dark room for 20 minutes and then they'll shoot these very dim lights and there's different colors. And that's more accurate, but it takes 30, 40 minutes to do. And if I'm you know, trying to get 100 people in a flight training program in the military through, this is much easier. But if, you, um, if you're going to a, an older physician, shall we say, these uh, oftentimes it'll show it to you in a book. Um, the book could be like 50 years old and the dyes fade and your eyes might be fine, but the dyes are messed up. They're designed to be shown under a specific incandescent light. And if they got weird fluorescent lights or some other weird color light that could shift the color. So you need to make sure if you're, if you want to fly, you want to get a medical, make sure you understand the rules in part 67 and what the, you know, what the deal is for eye charts. And you know, don't be afraid to ask questions or asking another doctor. Well, and, and that's the thing. If you uh, I that happened to me, and I have a thing in my my folder that I got when I was in ROTC, and I took that test, and for, ever since then, I always have a copy of that in my records, and I say, okay, you're good. You know, uh, we can probably cut away from. Oh that. yeah. Uh, one of the things that they want to see us, don't they? <laughs> well, they're going to whether they want to or not. One of the things that uh, I encourage people, if you're interested in getting a medical, learning how to fly. Start with the Part 67 regulations. You look up, you know, if you're going to go try to fly for a living, you need to look at the regulations for first class. If you just want to get a private pilot certificate and fly and get pancakes and hamburgers, just get you third class medical. The requirements you have to be able to meet are actually written down in the regulations. Turn to Part 67, look under third class medical, and it'll say you have to be able to see with this level of accuracy. You need to uh, correct it. You can, be, you can be uncorrected blind as a bat mm -hmm. as long as that you used to have to have a minimum. Now you don't. They can correct you in. And so if you are concerned about something like your vision or your hearing, go see your eye doctor or your hearing doctor and say, hey, these are the specifications I have to meet. Can you go ahead and do this test and see if I meet those or not? Mm -hmm. And even if you don't, you know, like in the eye doctor's office, they often, an optometrist doesn't often have the specialty equipment that say an ophthalmologist does. Right. And so you, you may get deferred. The FA says, we want you to go see a specialist and generate some records. And you might ask, what, what if I only have one eye? World famous uh, pilot, Oklahoma native, Wiley Post, flew around the world twice, once in 31 with Harold Gaddy, again in 33 solo, using the new Sperry autopilot. Um, yeah, he, he lost his eye in a uh, oil, uh, oil rig, accident, right? yeah. and then uh, used his workers' comp check to uh, go learn to fly. Um, so yeah, you can do that if you've had... Um, like LASIK surgery, any kind of changes, they'll wait for your eyes to stabilize. If you like literally got your eye poked out, you know, something happened. Once you've stabilized and you're used to being monocular, go in and take the test and you can do that. But there's people, uh, there was a UPS pilot had a first class and she had lost part of her arm below mm -hmm. the elbow. And even without a prosthesis, she was soda. She could go operate the airplane, could do everything she needed to do. So don't talk yourself out of it. Let a doctor talk you out of it. That's right. There was another lady. She was uh, genetically born with no legs. Oh yeah. And so she was able Hopefully to learn. Her. She was able to get approval to fly, but it was limited to the Urcoop mm -hmm. because the Urcoop had a a linkage between the ailerons and the rudder, so you didn't have to use your feet in flight. I'm, I'm sorry. She had no arms. Is that what? Okay. She yeah. had no. I, and so she flew with her feet. I said, yes. That was the deal, right? I forget what it was. She was missing two of the major appendages. Right. And the Urcoop has a mechanical linkage tying the ailerons and the rudders together. And so she was able to do it. Yeah, we can get a decent picture of this. Yeah. Oh, it's a video. <laughs> Just uh, three sorry. years ago, go. she had never been in an air. Get away from that. She's trying to find a good picture of her. Yeah, here we here go. go. Sorry, technical difficulties here. Yeah, there it is right there. Yeah. So this young lady born with uh born with with no arms was able to learn how to fly able to she demonstrate i can fly the airplane safely 
And because the air coop has a linkage between the rudders and the ailerons, you don't, when she's on the ground attacking, she, yeah, she, there are no rudder pedals. Right. So, in that airplane. yeah. And so, you know, she's able to, to drive it while taxiing on the ground and then come time for takeoff. She doesn't need access to the rudders. And so, uh, they, you know, she had a limitation. You could, mm -hmm. we, we, we've only checked you out and, and you've demonstrated that you can safely fly an air coop with this particular handicap and the FAA deemed that handicap significant enough right. that it needed if she wanted to change airplane as long as she can fly an air coop you know the greatest motivation to not gain weight is I can't exceed the gross <laughs> weight of my airplane right well they also we had a cousin of our former chief mechanic here at southeastern and uh he had had a spinal injury due to a, a jeep rollover and he could like stand I think a little bit but he really didn't have uh good use of his lower extremities and they had a deal where you could attach to the rudder pedals and um it was a control that you could stick your arm through and you your hand was available to use the throttle and do manipulate stuff but you could use your hand to move that control left to right for mm -hmm. rudders and your other hand with the ailerons and so as long as any airplane that was fitted with that he could fly so that was uh yeah so don't if you got a limitation uh you know check it out there's some some pretty interesting people out there doing still flying gary mackey one of the moderators asks, does Midway have an EMAS? If not, it probably needs it. Does it? Oh, yeah, oh Midway. Midway Chicago, yeah, Chicago Midway. Well, we can certainly, once you once you know what you're looking for, you can actually go to Google Earth. You can yeah. look from a, a top-down view and and, and decide. Uh, there's a reason that there's not that there's not large airplanes in and out of Midway. Just It's kind of like you don't see big airplanes in and out of Love Field, 737. Occasionally, you might see like a 75, but not not very often. EMAS system installed at Chicago Midway. So, yes, it does. Sounds like it does. There you go. There you go. Yeah, EMAS. In, some, in some places, yeah, there's not even room for it. But yeah. Let's see. Should I mention my conspiracy theory about Denver International? Oh, go for it. Keep talking for a minute. Let me go bring it up. Um, let's see if anybody else here has any conspiracy theories about Denver International Airport. Uh, yeah, Ford says, seriously, you get hate mail. I don't get hate mail. I get trolls in the comments, and most of them are probably the uh, Office of Special Affairs for the variant, the various Scientology organizations. Because, oh, that. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and like, there's just there's people out there. It's kind of like the end of course evaluations you get from students. Uh, one third of the class says there was way too much homework, and one third of the class says we didn't get near enough homework, and the other third says the class was fine. And I, I, I can't make them all happy, right? Like that's one, right after it's like. A Professor acts like you could care less about this class. Professor really enthusiastic, loves this class. <laughs> you can't, no. you can't make them both happy. No, you cannot. Okay, so here's my question. This is Denver International on the Google Earth. I don't know, anybody see anything particularly weird there? Possibly involving National Socialism. <laughs> <laughs> I flown into there and I was trying to get a map. Once I looked, it was like, "Holy crap! <laughs> did a uh, uh, former Nazi like design this airport or what?" Uh, that's what it looks like to me. They're still paying for that. They're almost caught up, though. Yeah, I'm uh, surprised that they uh, destroyed the old Stapleton so fast. That went away quick. Yeah, no, the the tower's still there. Is it oh, driving a restaurant or something? Or? I, there might be. I know that you're, like you're just driving through the subdivision, and mm -hmm. then here's this 11 story tall <laughs> tower. And uh, I think there's like a, a bar or something think, at the base. I think the, the base HOA itself. uses that to tell people where to park. Yes, that's the the, the, the HOA ticket enforcers up there. Um, what else you got there? Let's see. Ford asks, has the Supreme Court defined a mail yet? I, they never would. They would never pick up a case that's going to get involved in the identification of oh, gender. gender stuff? Yeah, yeah. that's – that's, I would bet all the dollars in my pocket and all the bar admissions that I have that they would never remotely take a case up, nor should they. There are much more pressing matters for the Supreme Court to pick up than what constitutes a male. Let's see. Uh, learning about life says it's believed that 10% of internal genitalia people have the fourth cone. Have in, the what? Uh, the fourth cone, that extra cone. Oh, well, yeah. That, that ability to see extra colors. Cone, yeah, sorry. And so it's believed I'm that, deaf. I can't yeah, that, that 10%. I thought you said the fourth tone. <laughs> No, uh, they uh, learning about life says it's estimated that 10% of internal genitalia people possess that, right? Yeah, that fourth cone. Let's see. The FAA is wild, no arms, sure, depressed, get lost. <laughs> 
Well, it, so and the, the good news is there has been slowly there there has been some improvement on that front. We actually had a mental health specialist come and present to our students yesterday about that. And the FAA has begun allowing limited uses of certain antidepressants, but with the ability to get approval is based on the cause of the, for the need. Mm-hmm. Are you depressed because you uh, you were a socialite and COVID hit and you couldn't see anybody for a year? Or are you depressed because you have a hormone imbalance and we're using or chemical imbalance and we're using that antidepressant until we can, uh, you know, adjust your yeah. diet or whatever to, to replenish those or, you know, find the multivitamin that, yeah. that gives you those. So, well, and you still have to be careful because there's been numerous cases. There's the famous German wings case where the guy, you know, killed everybody on the airplane, but there was the, uh, was it PSA, um, uh, British Aerospace 146 out in California, ramp agent, uh, had an ID, went in. Uh, oh, Jersey, yes. And, shot both pilots and crashed the airplane off the coast killed everybody um i think was it the egypt air crash that was pretty sure that was mm-hmm. a crew member doing that um a silk air crash in southeast asia so there, it there just was happens a, there in, was the in guy in seattle airplanes. stole a dash eight. Oh yeah he did but he just killed himself yeah he was doing aerobatics yeah. on a dash eight and uh but the um and then we just had the person down in dallas yeah and then so and then and then the guy at fedex yeah the, the, the attempted, attempted takeover yeah. at fedex yeah, yeah. and so and there's been a bunch of people who probably knew they were getting old, something was wrong, or they were going to lose their license and went up and had an accident in the airplane. And that's easier to explain than, you know, Bob killed himself. And yeah. uh, and I would be surprised if more people hadn't. And I think the FAs looked at that. But the point is, if you if your option is, hey, I need help. OK, you just lost your job. You're just going to get a lot of people that don't get help and don't yeah. lose their job until it's too well, late. Well, I mean, that's that's what we were talking about yesterday. Part of the discussion had was on uh, addiction and substance abuse. Nationally, about 16% of the population suffer from substance abuse nationally. Some the, of us enjoy it. It's it's true. It's true. For a while. Uh, the FAA estimates uh, about somewhere between 6 and 8% of airmen yeah. suffer from substance abuse. But if an airman reports substance abuse, they take away their medical okay. and say you can't find anymore. Because I would argue that the most powerful certificate a pilot has isn't their pilot certificate, it's yeah, the it's medical. medical yeah. Without a medical, a pilot certificate is just a credit card. It's useless, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't account for anything. Yeah, and that's and it's you know you obviously you don't want depressed pilots flying. I'd rather have depressed, properly medicated pilots flying than uh, the other way. But yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be like uh, alcoholism, where before that was just you're an alcoholic, you're gone. Now they'll they'll work stuff out. So uh, Arton Courts, who is, she's a PhD candidate. Who's that? Uh, Arton Courts, PhD candidate in political science. So she's uh, she does some teaching, mm-hmm. um, probably more than she would care to. <laughs> and uh, she said, you should see the student evaluations when you're a female. We were actually just talking about this at the chairs meeting, either this week or last week, mm-hmm. um, about ways to get to increase oh, student, yeah. like, the, you know, each department, each program sort of used to write its own. And we write. We gotten permission to write our own to uh, to uh, appease our creditors, um, but the university in the last several years went to an outside company that allegedly produces the most unbiased, un you know, without this implicit bias sort of course eval. We don't get great participation because it's all online and you can't force and the them. The questions to do it. are really vanilla. And there's fifty six freaking questions. Um, but that was one of the things was that they had you know. Do we want to bring it back in-house institutionally and work mm-hmm. on those? But our vice president of academic affairs is a female. Her first assistant is a female. And probably at least a third, maybe half the department chairs are female. And they all say, and I believe them, yeah. that you know the data indicates that two people doing the exact same thing, a man gets a better score than a woman mm-hmm. on the course evaluation. And when you have your vice president of academic affairs, your highest ranking mm-hmm. officer who outside to, the president. Who used to teach in biology. Yeah, who's, who's, a, who's a, 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 a microbiologist, mm-hmm. I believe, herself. And the current chair of biology is a female. The mm-hmm. chair of nursing is a female. The chair of accounting and finance is a female. Assistant vice president used to teach English. Yeah, female. yeah. Yeah, uh, assistant VP of academic affairs is a female, as is the chair of uh, so it's not psychology, yeah, it's like psycho- well, behavioral science, behavior there, there, yeah, because it's also got sociology stuff, yeah. behavioral science. So, we have a bunch of department chairs and, and upper administration who are female, and they all said, you know, we're willing to bring it back in house, we have to find a way to reduce it to the deal extent with, to yeah. deal with, handle, identify, account for uh, implicit bias, um, because you know. 
most of our department chairs are outstanding. Well, we're a teach first institution. We're not a research institution and they're outstanding educators. And you look at their male counterparts and you can't, you know, you can't tell me that Joe's better than Susie here. You just yeah. can't convince me of that. So art and courts, I, I absolutely, I absolutely believe that. Uh, let's see. I'm going back outside. All right. Watched a Mayday last night. Oh, the the show Mayday. Um, yeah. It's uh, the air emergency. Oh well, the, it depends the, where you watch the Canadian version, or the U.S. version. But they should they should have in Toronto about Trans Colorado flight to Durango. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that yeah. yeah. That that one was that one was wicked. She says yes. I teach way more than I'd like to. <laughs> she was actually, and I think I said it to you. She was just published. Uh -huh. I forwarded you that. Oh, okay. uh, that article in the political science journal mm -hmm. and she was one of the uh either co i'm not sure she's co uh, lead author or co-author but Good. uh yeah so i said that to you see uh will newman judge head jo jughead jones says comment it makes sense that if they can make advancements in car modifications for disabled people that advancements in airplane modifications should be the next thing yeah absolutely yeah. and you know for for small airplanes that's one thing it's um you know i've trying to think in the future for uh i guess eventually we're going to get to the um they'll just sort of roll you in strap you in and you're controlling everything with your thoughts yeah so uh yeah. But before we get there yeah I've, you know, and there's some um, well even the right flyer was technically a weight shift air aircraft no it, it, for the for the rudder no it, it was because i thought was, they were sitting in a cradle that was a weight shift no, cradle. The, um the Curtis early Curtis model d's ah. you strapped on a thing and you leaned left or right to move the ailerons and then you had a steering wheel because they were because they didn't have a standalone aileron it was wired and so you would just flex and change they, the shape they had of the, two, the flight brothers had two levers one was for pitch and one was for roll and yaw Woo! that would have been tough to control i'm just imagining if that. you learned on that it's okay that's it's, true yeah it's hard for me to process but it's kind of like if you look at the keyboard on a flight management system it's mm -hmm. a b c d oh, e yeah. but we're used to qwerty keyboards if all oh, if you learn on an abc keyboard it would you could probably be just as fast on that as anybody you brought on. up a, a horrible memory from my past <laughs> when i was in the air force and uh, the AWACS, the e3 airplanes um they assumed that all the people in the back end were not going to be touch typists because they weren't like, you know, back in the day when all the girls had to go to the take typing in high school and the boys did and we were in shop. Um, so they assumed that we wouldn't be able to, to type touch type. And I cannot, I don't, I type with two fingers and, but I know where the keys are and I can type pretty fast. And so all the keyboards were A, B, C, D, E. And the first thing you do is just, I had to get used to that new keyboard. And because the airplane could be bouncing around, the keys were really hard to push. You had mm -hmm. to almost use your thumb to push them. So to mash them no, around. No touch typing. The only person who had the had a nice keyboard was the computer display maintenance technician. He had a nice regular QWERTY keyboard with regular keys on it. And yeah, that was so yeah, that was irritating. I understand on the new airplanes, uh, the new versions with the updates, they got regular keyboards. So progress Ford says the problem with student feedback of that type is basically a popularity contest can't mm -hmm. be unrelated to actual marks uh scored by the students that's partially true partially untrue i mean because what we do is the students at least in our departments in our programs students fill out theirs and then the faculty fill out theirs and we sort of compare the yeah. two data sets but there's also um i mean my, one of the things i do whenever you buy anything online i'll look at the you know the user feedback and what i usually see is the the you the buy the bifurcated chart where there's people like, Oh, this was horrible. It took two weeks. This is the worst product ever. Nothing to do with the product or, you know, this is the best product I've ever used. It's wonderful. How long have they had it? Two days. Yeah. And so you get the, this is the best, you know, zero stars or, you know, one star or five stars. And so I always, you go in the middle because usually there it's like, yeah, this was pretty good, but this feature wasn't so good. And you know, this feature stopped working after all and you get more in step. So the more detailed stuff I can get, I usually look at the stuff and my, my next thing is to look at the written handwritten comments and that's what i'll look at because there it's specifically yeah i like this but i thought the book was horrible and there was something specific you will also get the yeah. i can't stand that this class is at eight o'clock <laughs> and we most of our students are going to go to airlines where they don't have to get up early yeah th yeah there's not a flight that i'm on in a few weeks headed to a different state for spring no. break that leaves dallas at six yeah, they always you know earliest show time would be noon yeah. If you're a freight dog, if you're freight, <laughs> if you're freight dog, and you get the crew rest at mid at noon yes. for a, a, a 10 p.m. showtime, right. 
at the at the airport. Oh, the good old days. Um, and then Art and Court says comments are also very sexist. Women are often described as warmer, loving, and way more comments about their appearance. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we have the department chair of behavior or uh, social science, uh, Glenn, Glenn yeah. uh, suit and tie every day. He's a, he, he used to sport a mullet. So that's, that's true. Half a well, he's from off. Louisiana. Give that's him a true. break. And uh, uh, he's high stakes testing. You get one, you know, there may be a quiz or two, but one final exam. And that's make or break it in this history class all the way down to is Carl in the art department. No, he's a uh, math math. He's, and it's blue jeans. I mean, it's, it's cargo shorts, flip flops, no socks, no socks. All 12 months at, or yeah 12 months out of the year yeah. he's from he's from michigan so yeah yeah tie-dye t-shirt and he's always covered in chalk dust yes because the math department still uses chalkboards yeah. i wish we did too i wish we could get rid of all the whiteboards and bring chalkboards back because the the whiteboard marker dust stan mm -hmm. only wears black pants during the week so i wear a, a, a variety of browns uh so the black markers or any color marker can his pants he doesn't know but i it's it's very difficult to wash out chalk dust comes out of everything when you wash it so yeah, i wish I we had like, chalk i like chalkboards the natural product that's right yes she says she was the author number one on a four author paper in the number one journal in the discipline i'm greatly humbled by the experience yes that's uh, and it cost me a laptop in 2020. She died trying to process the data. <laughs> uh, who was uh, speaking? Who was it? The rate my professor and some of the other online <laughs> ones. You know, I'm still upset because I, I know nobody thought I was a hottie. That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not sexist. Well, all, our, our chief instructor was described on rate my pro professor is described as looks like Bruce Willis. Interesting. And if I know you, you guys don't know who he is, but Stan, yeah, he looks nothing like Bruce Willis. Well, yeah. in that they have similar hairlines. I think that's yes. probably where they're both men, and yeah. they both have a similar hairline. That's it. I think that's where the the comparison yes. to Bruce Willis ends. Uh, Gary, who is a grandfather, says just for age comparison, I took typing in high school. Only male in the class. I took the class because that's where the girls were. I had to be, I had to fight to be allowed to take the class. It was in the early seventies. Yeah. Well, there you go. When I, when, um, I remember, uh, my uh, dearly departed wife, uh, thought that I should go, uh, go to Texas women's college because, you know, it's where all the women were. Oh, and not. Art, uh, art and court says, and all the dry erase markers are always dead. What's that? The markers in the classrooms oh, yes. are always dead. I've gotten to where I carry a couple in my bag oh, and, and, and stands always got a few. I stole your blue one, but I left it in the classroom. Oh, thank you. Yes. All right. Let's see. Uh, wonder if you could use the looks like Bruce Willis of evidence as teaching experience on your application. Well, he he did receive he did receive tenure. He's actually yeah, he he's did. actually nearing retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has never said yippee ki yay, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> No, nor, a, nor has he crawled through an AC duct. No. And he's never he, done that either. He, uh, I did find at uh, the local Lowe's a T-shirt. It was for gardeners, but it was so apropos to our, our chief pilot. Is uh, Whenever he was a kid and you'd be playing sports and, you know, you'd fall down and hurt yourself, um, dad would just say, just yeah, rub some dirt on it. So I found a T-shirt that said rub some dirt on it, and he was quite pleased with that. That fixes everything. Hey, you can't go wrong with that, right? No. All right. What last questions do you have? We've been going about an hour. Yeah. So uh, any last questions that you have, whether it's related to airport signs and markings or airport uh, conspiracies. Yes. Um, and and we, we, today we covered just a few. There's hundreds, literally hundreds of signs and markings. And then the lighting, there's, you know, even more lighting um, that mean, di you know, different colors. And, and that's uh, one of my other favorite questions for air traffic control is, is that there's four components to the instrument landing system. There's the localizer for lateral control, the glide slope for vertical control. There's marker beacons that send where, where you are in the approach. And there's a fourth one they always forget, appropriate airport lighting. I always remember the acronym GLAM, glide slope, localizer, approach lights, and marker beacons. There you go. GLAM. We're, we're, all, about, we're all about acronyms. That's right. And abbreviations. Although for those of you who are interested, the United States is currently hiring a new astronaut class. Yes, we are. You need to either be a student of with an, ex an expected completion date of summer of 2025 or a graduate of a uh, nationally or internationally approved test pilot school. <laughs> you need to be a physician, so either an MD or a DO, or you need to have a master's plus 54 hours or a PhD in one of the enumerated uh, uh, engineering disciplines. Uh, aeronautical, aerospace, propulsion, 
uh, mechanical, structural. So there you go. So if anybody's looking for us uh, new employment, uh, and the pay is a grand total of one hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars a year. For yeah, as famous as they become and as cool as that job is, they don't get paid very well. Yeah. It's at the end of the day, they get paid about what a lieutenant, what, what a what a full board colonel gets paid. Yeah, on the government scale. Oh, okay. Oh, I know this airport. Yeah, this. I just like this airport because uh, this is uh, Clinton Sherman, the old Clinton Sherman Air Force Base. It's nice because it's a thirteen thousand foot long runway used to be b52 base you can see the alert old alert facility the strategic air command yeah. rapid response facility yeah. and then you know you go back and you realize i can still see that i can still see that in fact if you in fact you can still see there there are there's still a very small area on the west side of the airport enclosed by fencing that's under the control of the department of the navy right there yeah. it's fenced in and those are originally as i understand it were nuclear weapon storage bunkers I will have to give you the appropriate answer. We can neither confirm nor deny the presence of special weapons at this facility. And when they uh, when they closed that B-52, when they closed that that facility at the end of the Cold War, whenever that was, they closed it. They had a the, the B-52s were based there, so they didn't do depot maintenance, but they always had spare engines and things laying around. And they had crates and crates of engines, and it was logistically more feasible to simply bury crates of engines out in the field than it was to ship them somewhere. So for those folks who are brave enough to go poking around with a metal detector, they may find <laughs> uh, a B-52 engine shoved in a wooden crate somewhere. You could probably buy one in a crate that's been refurbished but never put back, never used. But yeah, they, um, yeah, if you want to talk about horror... Uh, nightmare scenarios for environmental stuff at tinker when i first got to tinker oh, 81 Lord. i met a guy who just had gotten his phd in sanitation engineering at the expense of the air force and he was there to help with the heavy metal problem they would just literally dig holes in the ground and pour crap in there for all sorts of horrible stuff so and tinker was built in 1941 the, yeah uh, during the world war ii era because originally the c-47 was produced there they, they produced that's one of the places they built it yeah. yeah and so it's and the gates on the east side are named after military airplanes and the because you got marauder du, oh, du, oh, sorry, yeah. yeah you got, and then you have some gates named after generals yeah. douglas and, or i'm sorry airplane manufacturers douglas and there's one i can't pronounce ruskacy Ruska or something i can't remember ruskacy gate yeah. uh and then uh, and then you go down to the south to the southwest side, and it's just like gate six, gate yeah. seven, gate eight. And if you look just north of, of the base, you'll see uh, all the roads there, are like Boeing and Lockheed and Air Coop, and they're all airplane mm -hmm. manufacturer names. Well, the it's not the the uh, Midwest City High School is just a few miles north of home the, of the bombers, the bombers exactly, yes. and uh, that's where the name comes from. Now, the newest mid uh, Middell Public High School on the east side is Carl Albert. That has nothing that's to it. do. Yeah. That has to do with the former Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Yes. But uh, we actually, in my family, we have a gavel used by mm, right. Carl Albert uh, while uh, presiding over the a man over the of Congress. great political stature, but not physical stature. Yes, a, a very he. Uh, the they did not call it the Albert treatment; they called it the Johnson treatment because Carl Albert was was a a, a man of of nominal stature. Yes, but uh, was a political was an absolute political mastermind. Yes. No. Oh, well. oh, is this is this is Tinker? Oh yeah, that's okay. My, I, I didn't know what you were pulling up here. Yeah, it was just the old Tinker Air Force Base, and if you go just north there, yeah, you look at all the Air Group Drive, Fairchild, Grumman, Tinker, Rickenbacker, Lockheed. Yeah, uh, and then if you go to the east side down Douglas Boulevard, yeah, they have Douglas the. Uh, if you go to the Boeing plant, is is, is the Boeing facility where they taxi them across the road? Oh no, the Boeing stuff is where right, the, right over here. Oh, that one. That it. Uh, that's it's, the new it's, hospital. It's further down. Name there it is, right there. Oh, this. Yeah. I thought it was Boeing. Maybe somebody else. But. Well, they, yeah, they also had. They, they, yeah, this used to be. A, um, GM had a plant down here. They, they. Yeah, they G, yeah, GM's down on the south side now. That's used the, to be. Yeah, three thousand. Uh, it's now building. Um, uh, okay. Three thousand one. And there's my old ride. That's right. The seven hundred seven A wax and the B fifty two with no motors. That's right. The, yeah, those are just the uh, engine uh, engine mount pods. The bone. Yeah, the B one. The B one. All the airplanes. There should be some tankers up here where they. Uh, oh, some C one thirties. I don't know what they're. Oh, that's. I don't know what they're doing there. Ah. See if anybody can ID that. What is that? 
Oh, I know what that is. What is it? It's the Navy's E3. Yeah. Navy's E6. Or, or it's the E3 Century, uh, E6 the E6. Mercury, E6 though. Mercury. Talk it's to a, the nuclear it, submarines. Yep. They, not, talks to the nuclear vessels. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. And that yeah, works. There's, oh, there, there you go. Tankers. A tanker with no tail. Yeah, the tankers and the bombers there. The newest tanker and bomber were built in like 1963 and 64. And we've still got a little bit less than 100 B-52s and close to 400 KC-135s. They built almost about 800 of both of them back in the early 60s. And that's still our primary tanker. And now it is slowly being replaced with the KC-46, which is the 767. Yeah, but but I, they're not going to order eight hundred of them though. The budgets no, are different now. But they're also um, they're still having problems with that airplane. And they then they had the KC ten, which looked pretty, but I don't. Which was yeah, it's been phased out. Yeah, yeah. there's uh, yeah. Part of the problem is you can have you don't want to have all your gas in one place. It's better to sometimes to have three little airplanes than one big one because three little ones can go in different places and fuel people. So anyway, let's see. Uh, yeah. Anybody who works with excrement has my highest regard. Ain't no way I'd be doing a job like that. And what? The uh, the the sanitation engineer. Oh yes. Yeah. Although although ultimately they worked in heavy metal disposal, yeah, they too. they probably researched sewage yeah, systems I mean, qu uh, quite a bit. Yeah, he didn't deal primarily with excrement. It was mostly uh, industrial uh, waste, which could be pretty nasty. All right, guys, we're going about an hour six here, so we'll wrap it up and leave it with you. Yeah. Uh, as always, I know you have a ton of uh, creators when it comes to YouTube, and somebody said the other day something like 30 hours a second of content gets uploaded to YouTube. So the fact that you spend what f what few precious moments you have on a Saturday with the good doctor and I, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, my wife says you, you need, guys need better hobbies. <laughs> but thank you. Appreciate everybody coming by. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll do it again tonight at uh, 8.30 Central, 7.30 on the East Coast. Convert to your local time. I'll leave you with my beloved airframe. There you go. Appreciate everybody coming by. Do me a favor. Be kind to somebody. We'll talk soon. Bye.